Hey everyone, how's it going? And you're back with Citywide Blackout. Your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. For this episode, Taryn and Juno of the band Sorry Mom join me, and we talk all about the different scenes they've connected with, both in the queer and punk communities. We look at the amazing fan base they've built since starting, which was best seen at a recent show they did at Bowery Electric, one of the last ones for 2021. We look at their plans for this year, which include more shows and plans for new music releases. I am joined now by two members of the of the band. Uh, sorry, Mom, Taryn Ganji and Juno Moreno. Join me. Welcome to the show. It's uh, it's uh, great to have you here. Thank you so much for having us, Max. It's awesome to be here. All right, all right. So uh, there's uh, there's definitely a lot to talk about. You have uh, your new single out, uh, "Hit the Back." This was released uh, back uh, back in August. But I want to start by just talking about um, your recent show over at the Bowery Electric. This was uh, your last show of the year. So um, how did you wind up playing at the Bowery, and what was that like for you? Playing at the Bowery was uh, such a dream come true. We Started off being sort of Boston, New England based, but we've quickly found our home in New York. Uh, Juno's from New York, so it's perfect. Uh, We're kind of calling that home now, and we're planning on relocating there soon, uh, as soon as they graduate from college. So uh, it's really awesome to be playing in New York. And the Bowery, it's just the whole Bowery venue network is so iconic in New York, and it's always been a dream to play at a Bowery show. And You know, you kind of start lower and then you build your way up uh, the Bowery ladder. But starting at the Electric was amazing. It's such a cool venue. You got that beautiful neon sign behind you when you pack the the house. It's awesome. And it was such a cool feeling. And it was a great way to end off the year. We had a a lot of shows in the fall. We were very fortunate to be able to tour around New England and the Northeast a little bit. And that show, we had a phenomenal turnout and the vibes were awesome. And it was just such a great way to end the year. I, I personally loved playing it. I've actually been to the Bowery um uh, once before and but yeah, the Bowery is just like a one of a kind. Had you ever uh, played there before? Before, no. Uh, How did you wind up um, getting uh, connected out for that show? Um, Taryn does most of our booking. She's kind of our fake manager at the moment, <laughs> and she just even I know that she spends much much time reaching out to venues and um, sending out like a booking email and asking when we can set up a show. So we were definitely pretty excited when they got back to us and let us set one up. Okay. All right. Now you mentioned that you've also been doing a bunch of shows in the fall. Um, uh, Whereabouts have you had the chance to play? Yeah. So in the fall, we started off at the press room up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, which was great because I've, you know, grew up in like the Northern Massachusetts, uh, Southern New Hampshire area. So it was really close to home, which was great for me. And after that, we played shows uh, in Boston. We played a bunch of shows in New York. We were down in Providence, Rhode Island. We were in Connecticut, uh, which is the state where we all met. So it was really great to play a show in Connecticut together. Um, but we, we've really been all over. I think all in all, we had about 20 shows in the fall. A lot of them fell in New York between Brooklyn and Manhattan. But uh, we were really all over the Northeast. It was wonderful. All right. Um, so it sounds like New York, uh, is, a f- is, um, familiar, like stomping grounds for, uh, f- uh, for the band. Yeah. The punk music scene out there has been really, really amazing. And the queer music scene in New York is phenomenal. And they've been so open and welcoming to us. And I mean, New York is, it's the big city. It's, it's the best place to be. So we've absolutely loved playing in New York. I'd like to ask a little bit more about like both scenes you mentioned, uh, the punk scene and the queer scene. Um, what's it, um, uh, like out there? I really feel like there's, and Juno can probably speak to this uh, as much as I can too, but I feel like punk is really coming back. Uh, And especially, I mean, punk has always been such a welcoming environment, but now, you know, the world is ready to welcome punk. So punk has always been a really like queer scene. It's, I feel like where social outcasts go to play music. Uh, And now the rest of the world is sort of, uh, you know, gearing up to accept that and punk is getting a little bit more mainstream and yeah, I don't know the scene out there. I'm sure it's been there for much, much longer than than we've been alive. Uh, but it's awesome to be sort of in this new wave of it and be joining it now. There's a lot of a lot of women out there now. There's a lot of uh, queer women out there. It's really wonderful to see. We've recently been playing shows um, for a, a band of queer wrestlers. We play at their um, we play at their wrestling shows. We play uh, songs in between fights, which has been. Really crazy. That was one of the first New York shows that we played, and it was really fun to meet all those people. Cool. Yeah, we were uh, we were sort of upstate with them, actually. 
uh, they were having like a big uh, queer wrestling event, like in a field somewhere. And it was, it was super, super fun to play. It's a really great scene. A wrestling match in a field. I have gone to so, so many of those that I, I think that that, that that's like the hallmark of like the indie wrestling scene. So what's the name of the, uh, the wrestling group? International World Wrestling and the wrestler that uses our song as her walkout song is Sassy Boatwright. She's this really cool queer female wrestler and she's fucking awesome. We love playing with her. <laughs> yeah, her uh her tagline uh involves uh it's like I'll steal your girl, I'll fuck your mom. So so we play uh, I fucked your mom and she walks out into the ring to us playing that song and it's it's super fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard that song a few times. I that I think <laughs> is a just like the most like like intense wrestling opener you cannot come up with. <laughs> yeah, it, it fits really well at their shows. Abs- definitely, definitely. Okay. Um so we talked a bit about the uh about the scenes in New York, but you've had the chance to play like elsewhere too. Of uh, of course you've done a couple shows in Boston. You mentioned playing in New Hampshire. Where do you think you have your like best fit? I would say definitely New York so far. I think that just with the city being the largest on the northeast, you have so many venues and so many other awesome bands and New York has an amazing music scene and, and, you know, I'm from Boston personally, Juno's from New York, but I'm from Boston. I love Boston. I love music in Boston, but music in New York is almost unparalleled. I mean, maybe Nashville, maybe LA, but uh, Chicago, but I mean, it's one of the major music cities uh, in the world, especially in this country, definitely in the world, I would think too. So it's, it's really found, we found our home there. It's uh, been where we've most been most concentrated throughout the fall. Yeah, we love we love New York. I'm from New York, so I um, knew a lot of the venues that when we started. I knew a lot of the venues that I like wanted us to play at really bad. So it's been very exciting to get to play around in venues that I knew and that I've seen bands play before when I was a kid, which is really cool. So how did the three of you meet up? So we actually met in college. We all went to the same school. Connecticut College uh, down in New London, Connecticut. And it was actually Grace who brought us together. She just had this idea to start uh, a band with no men in it and play awesome punk music because the music scene at our college was really male dominated and there weren't uh, really a lot of openings or space for women. So Grace literally See, created We never a space played a headlining show. So yeah, all of, all of college, we were never able to play a headlining show. We only had we only got to open for the other bands, even though we played for like two, three years. Yeah, it wasn't a super welcoming scene for uh for women. So we uh, Grace started this group, and even while we were there, yeah, it still wasn't super welcoming. But we've had a lot of success after leaving college. But yeah, that's where we all met, sort of in that scene, and that was the ideology that the band was uh, born of. I want to ask about the music itself. Like you mentioned before, one of the songs is I Fucked Your Mom. So you obviously don't have like a filter for like what you say and what you sing. Um, has that like always uh, always been the case with the band? Uh, that's probably better for Juno. Juno is our principal songwriter and lyricist. Um, so I write the music for the band. Um, when I started writing music, It was my freshman year of college and it was the three of us just kind of playing for fun. And it was the first time that I was playing music in a space where my own mother wasn't going to see it. So, you know, naturally I'm 18. I I go a little crazy and I wrote some songs that were, that were very out there and just were like the most fun for me to do. And fuck your mom. We ended up actually me and Grace improv that in the studio because I just had the idea to write a song called I Fucked Your Mom, and I had the riff written down for it. And we just got in the studio and said whatever came off the top of our heads and kept our first takes. I would have loved to have seen the reaction of the um, uh, the producer. Taryn actually produced everything for us. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it's all in, it's all just the three of us making everything. Nice, nice. So, uh, Taryn, are you, are you like entirely uh, self-taught when it comes uh, to music production? Yeah, I uh, I studied a little music production and engineering in college, and then I uh, really got passionate about it and pursued it on my own uh, after college, too. Um, so, yeah, I used to laugh at how silly we were being when we were in the studio. It was just me laughing at the two of them. <laughs> I love it. 
I love it. Do you ever come up with a song that you say, okay, we can't, we like, we like just can't record this one? Uh, yes, but Taryn wouldn't uh, have ever heard about them because I write the songs in my room in the dark of night alone <laughs> and <laughs> decide what, what can and can't be shown to, you know, others. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I will say everything. Everything Juno has ever decided to show me has been genius. So uh, if they've ever shown me a song, I've been like, we have to record this. This is going to be the next greatest song ever written. Uh, but I'm sure they keep a lot of things to themselves. But I wish they would show me everything. I'm sure it's all genius, but they're very <laughs> self critical. Some of it really is not. <laughs> I write probably a song or two a week, and I'm going to say out of a full in a full year, maybe eight of those will be any good. That's fair. I really liked Awesome Party Dude because that reminds me of so many like house parties I went to when I was um out living in Boston. Where I'm just like, I don't want to be here. I want to go home. This fucking sucks. Uh, that song was actually kind of funny because a lot of people uh, relate to it, and we hear that a lot of people we hear that a lot of people like really like find it like relatable with parties that they've gone to. I actually don't uh, go to many parties. And certainly at the time of writing the song, I've not been invited to very many. So I just kind of made it all up. So, yeah, the entire song is fictional. People are like, oh, who, who's the person the song is about? And Juno's like, I don't know. I made the whole thing up. But they're just a yeah. phenomenal storyteller. So it's cool that There's something not super fictional connects with so many people. Yeah, it really, it really sounds like it's based on a true story. Yeah, it's a song about, I tried to write, it was just, I wanted to try my hand at a breakup song. Yeah, and, and it's so detailed. I never broken up with anybody before. Um, so that was just kind of my gander at what it might feel like. I want to go back a little bit to uh, the Bowery Electric show, that this is potentially your last show until until the spring. Um, is, is that uh, still the case? And if so, like, what's going to be happening between like now and the spring? Um, <laughs> uh, it ends up not being our last show until the spring. Our next show is in January. Um <laughs> But uh, we are planning very few shows next year so we can focus on recording the next album and getting that hope, getting that out hopefully sometime in the spring. How would you sum up the Sorry Mom sound? How would you sort of like describe the band to someone else? I don't know. I guess, um, oh man, that's part, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question. I feel like Juno is the best equipped to answer it, but and I seem to have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's hard. I mean, we're definitely trying to channel, uh, you know, the riot girl movement for sure. That could be one way to describe it. We definitely pride ourselves on the queerness in our music um, and how queer the music is because we're queer and we're performing it. Um, definitely punk. Definitely. Uh, I feel like any of those things would work well. Queer, riot girl, punk. I try to write music that uh, like gay 15 year olds would want to hear because they're not hearing anything else like that that's written for them. So I guess gay 15 year old music. Yeah. Yeah. We really write like for queer listeners. So it's important to us. Okay. Is there not a lot of music out there like yours that kind of appeals to, uh, uh, to either uh, fan base? Um, sure there is there, but there is but it's really hard to find because it's not what's being talked about ever yeah it's not in the mainstream uh whatsoever and i do think that in a way that that's kind of changing like with i don't know music is now being marketed mostly online through social media so um you know the radio stations and the labels don't get to control what's becoming mainstream nowadays and i know that they tend to shy away from anything that's not uh, super white, super straight, super male. So now the fans are in control of what's mainstream because music is being marketed on social media and on the internet. So now I think you're seeing a little bit more of it pop up, but historically it has been hard to find because it was uh, unfortunately quite niche and probably quite buried by the industry. So where is the band uh, going from here? I, I know you mentioned that you're going to be working on the uh, the new album. Um, what's the overall plan for the uh, for uh, 2022? 2022 uh the loose plan is definitely we have to hunker down and uh finish writing and recording mixing mastering the works uh for our album that's going to come out and we already have a couple of those songs written we've been performing a handful of them live uh, just to give people sort of like an early taste but um we definitely need to take the focus away from touring and shows for a bit at least until that album's done and once the album's out we would love to go on 
a tour that pulls us out of the Northeast. We've been pretty much like New York, Boston, Rhode Island, uh, New England. And we love to go to even Pennsylvania, DC, Maryland, Chicago. We love to get out West, like Portland, Seattle, uh, LA. So we would love once the album drops uh, to embark on a tour across the country. That would be hopefully the dream. Of course, who knows what's going to happen with COVID and variants and all that, but that's the plan for now. That's what we're talking about. And that's, what's in the works. What was the last uh, couple of years um, I like with the band? Because it looks like you've only like recently come onto the scene. Yeah. The uh, last yeah we years... didn't plan on continuing as a band before we released our album. Like, yeah. We just, we... we didn't know I was going to hear it. Yeah. We um like three, I think we're coming up on three years in about like probably February, March. Uh, where we just sort of met in college. We started off playing covers. Juno you know, had a handful of originals. I ended up graduating after my junior year. So it was sort of hard to continue a band when one of the members was gone. And then Grace graduated, uh, but ended up staying in the Connecticut area. And I was in Boston and we had always talked about recording our originals. And I was trying to get everyone up to Boston because I was now working at a recording studio there. And I was, you know, like, anytime you guys are free, let's go, come on up. And during a winter break, we finally got everyone together and they both came up to Boston. And even though at that point I'd been out of college for over a year and Grace was out of college and it just seemed like something we'd done so long ago, we recorded the originals. Juno had a couple new ones written too, and we mixed them, mastered them, put them out on a whim, did not think anyone was going to hear it. Um, and then it just blew up and we've been so fortunate. And now it's, I mean, it was always a dream to have this band continue into to you know, a career for the rest of our lives. And now it seems like it's actually happening and it's, it's been really, really amazing. So the, the vision was always to have that happen. Logistically, we never knew if it would happen and luckily it's happening. So. <laughs> yeah. One thing I saw is that you have, um, I believe it's uh, over 192,000 listeners on Spotify. Uh, does that surprise you that you've been able to, to create like that kind of fan base in such a, a short amount of time? Yes. yes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, and I mean, yeah, we, the day, okay. So the album dropped, the EP dropped on Spotify on a Friday. And that morning, Juno posted a TikTok from our band account that had like 150 I, followers. I just made the band account that morning. So yeah, like, like created, I just downloaded the app. Yeah, downloaded TikTok, made a post. We only had a handful of followers, like friends from college. That was it. That got like notified when someone in their contacts made a TikTok. And then posted a TikTok like, hey, like my band's album just came out with a little snippet of I Fucked Your Mom. And it just blew up and took off. So the very day it hit Spotify was the very day it blew up. It was so fast. It was so unexpected. And um, yeah, it, it came at us pretty fast. And our following has just grown since then. Our fans have kept up the momentum. They talk about us to other people. We play at shows. We meet new fans. And we've really garnered uh, a really strong following on like Spotify alone. So it's, it's been really, really great. Very unexpected, but uh, we're really lucky. We're really grateful for our fans. Sorry for all the clanging. I just dropped a bowl. That's okay. No problem. Juno's a certified chef. Ooh, really? Michelin star. Yeah, they're, they're very talented in the kitchen. They deserve some Michelin stars, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. My other career plan. <laughs> Do you like hear back from a lot of the fans just like talking about the music or talking about like meeting you? We what? We do. Yeah, we, we do hear from fans a lot. We get um we get direct messages on social media. We'll have people tag us in posts. They'll comment on our posts. Um we'll also get emails from fans. Our email is on our Instagram bio, so anyone can email us and we'll get really sweet messages from them there too. So yeah, we definitely hear from them a lot. Uh at shows, people will come up to us and just say the sweetest things. So yeah, our fans are awesome. We hear from them a lot the growth especially in the fan base just in uh, in such like a short amount of time and do you think that that kind of speaks to just the presence of sorry mom or does it also do you think speak to like what you said before about like the lack of music that kind of caters to like the uh, the queer punk fans i would definitely say at least for me my guess is that it would be the latter um i'm not going to pretend like we have like the biggest strongest presence in the world like maybe one day we will but but for now, like, I don't want to toot our own horn or anything. I think it really is like young queer listeners are hungry for music that speaks to them, for music that's written by people like them and written by people for them. 
I, I don't know. I, I think that that's really probably it. And there are so many other great bands out there that we could point people towards that are doing really similar things too. So it's definitely not just us. It's definitely that this genre of music is growing and becoming more accessible to people. And we're a part of that, which is awesome. During the pandemic, of course, like, you know, no shows, no meeting the fans. How did you keep things going uh, during that time? I think the pandemic is the only reason that we ever got started. Because we released our we released our our first album right in the height of things in April, after like the first lockdown had happened, um, so everybody was, you know, like looking for new music, and everyone's kind of trapped inside. And immediately there was kind of like a social media wave that blew us up, and I think that was largely thanks to people being in a very confused spot and looking for new things. Totally agree. I've heard that a lot, actually. I've heard from like a lot of like writers and musicians that that for them actually lockdown was kind of a good thing because like I mean not good in a sense that you know of course we couldn't do shows but good because they all of a sudden had all this time so they're putting out all these like albums and books and things like that so it's uh, interesting how that you know there was a negative obviously but also there was like a positive too. Yeah, definitely an upside from like a, even from like a let's hunker down and like write more songs type of perspective, or I'm going to sit inside for a couple months, and just mix this entire project perspective. Like we were able to do a lot of things because the world wasn't so open yet. And that ended up being a blessing, at least from the perspective of making music. Okay. So um, talking about uh, future shows, you mentioned that one, uh, I wanted to kind of like get out of the Northeast. California definitely. Not. We hear a lot of a lot of requests to come to California. Yeah, definitely Good. California, like LA, San Diego. And I actually think um outside of New York, our number one city is Chicago. So I would love to go play for our Chicago fans. We have so many listeners in Chicago, and I would love to get out there and just like give them a show. We also have fans in like Quebec in Toronto. So I would love to get into Canada if that's possible ever. Uh, that would be awesome. Might have to get a visa for that or something, but <laughs> learn French. Hey, make it happen. You know, you never know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, Taryn, you know, thanks. Uh, thanks so uh, much for joining me. Of course, uh, loving the music. And uh, where do folks go to learn more about you and check out the band's work? We, you can find us on any social media platform. We're at Sorry Mom the Band. Uh, Instagram, I think you'll get like the most up close snapshot of us uh, and who we are and what we do. But you can also find us. We're sorry, mom, on Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere that you listen to music. Uh, we're out there. Yeah, that's our band camp. It's we All are right. Sorry. Yeah, we are sorry, mom. On <laughs> Just look for the purple, the purple flower that's frowning. That's us. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Brian Murphy from One Time Mountain, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout with Max Bowen. Rock on. Okay, everyone, that brings this episode to a close. Big thanks to Taryn and Juna for joining me, and definitely check out their music. The writing is absolutely amazing. You can follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Get at me at citywidemax at yahoo.com and check out the show wherever you find your podcasts, as well as every Saturday at 10 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. To close things out, I've got two songs from Sorry Mom, Awesome Party Dude, and hit the back. As always, keep those ears open. Well, it's a cool, cool party. Thanks for telling me to come back to your house that we grew up in back in July. Did you know that you forgot to call me on my birthday? Well, that's okay.
need you to search my clothing Pat me down and feel the molding Cause underneath this table feels so good to me And I need you to be my motor And run me till I can't go further Cause every turn you take is just exciting me Ain't I the best you have? 